As you know, this is in the context of the club on microbiota. And by the way, uh, we have now entered uh, the second phase, I would say, of the USF initiative on microbiome. We have now officially applied for the uh, USF Institute on microbiome, which will be across the different colleges and departments. And while this may sound uh, somehow bureaucratic and administrative to many of you, which I fully understand. This would be very important for the support of research on microbiome at USF and also for the support of uh, faculty members. Now, in the context of, the, uh, of this webinar, it's really a great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Benoit Chassin. Benoit is uh, actually in Paris. So he will give his seminar from, uh, from Paris. And uh, Benoit has been trained uh, and got his master and then PhD in, uh, in France, in Clermont-Ferrand, in a research unit. And this is very interesting, uh, working uh, as an uh, agronomic, and we, we call this the INRA. So it's a, it's a research agency which is very complementary to uh, uh, the INSERM and CNRS, which are the equivalent of uh, NIH and NSF. And then he moved as a postdoc um, to a highly renowned uh, re laboratory from Dr. Professor Gewirtz at Georgia State University in Atlanta. And he stayed there as an assistant professor and working, and this is what he's going to describe, on the interplay between microbiota, intestinal inflama inflammation, inflammatory bowel disease. And now he has been recruited in France, in the French INSERM, which again stands for the French NIH. Uh, he is a team leader uh, working in the center of Paris in the Cochin Medical School. And um, importantly, he has received the most prestigious European grant that we call the European Research Council grant, which are highly competitive uh, and actually uh, putting in competition scientists from all over Europe. So it's really a great pleasure, Benoit, to, to welcome you at USF. Benoit knows some of USF because he has kindly accepted to interact with us on some projects. And so again, uh, we great pleasure to, to welcome you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Merci beaucoup. Uh, hi, everyone. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, can you see my slides and hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So today I'm going to present a little bit of, that, uh, of the work that we did uh, in the past and that we are currently developing. We're really focusing on uh, host microbiota interaction and how it's really important to keep a proper nomenclature. So first, uh, a very brief introduction about, uh, about the gut microbiota. So you know this is a very complex community of uh, microorganism that's uh, living within the intestine and that's very important for uh, nutrient and calorie extraction, nutrient digestions. It's also very important to uh, favor the maturation of the immune system and it's really playing a lot of uh, numerous very important role. And it's interacting with a very large area, which is our uh, intestinal mucosa. And you can see here on, on this picture that you have the, the, the microbiota on the top that is lining on top of the mucosa. And there is actually something really wrong in this picture where you can think that the microbiota is really in direct contact uh, with the mucosa, which is actually not the case at all. And if you are doing a proper fixation of the mucus uh, layer, this is actually how it should look like, where you can see that you clearly have here on the bottom uh, the epithelium in uh, purple. Uh, and after you have this sterile, completely sterile zone uh, labeled in green, which is a mucus layer. And you can see that you, have, you do not have any bacteria in this uh, mucus layer. And then uh, after this mucus layer, you have uh, the microbiota with the bacteria labeled in green, in uh, red, sorry. And you see, it's very important, and this is what I'm going to present you today. It's very important to keep this uh, no man's land here and to avoid the presence of any bacterium closer that can lead to uh, uh, chronic intestinal permission. So this is why in the intestinal tract, there is a lot of uh, mechanism to avoid uh, 
macrobiota, what we call macrobiota encroachment and the penetration of some bacteria within the mucus layer. For example, for example, you have the, the synthesis of antimicrobial peptides. You have also the synthesis of immunoglobulin A and immunoglobulin G that are going to be really important to, to keep this homeostasis. And if for some reason you have few bacteria able to penetrate the mucus layer, you will have a lot of receptors, all the TLRs, the NLRs that are going to be activated, leading to immune cells recruitment in order to uh, going back, in order to go back to, to, to the steady state level. And one example I wanted to start my presentation with is uh, our previous uh, observation that if you delete uh, toll-like receptor 5, which is again one of the toll-like receptors expressed at the mucosa. If you delete this gene involved in the recognition of bacterium, you can see that there is a subset of animals, around 10%, that develop very, very strong colitis. So you see you have a rectal prolapse here, and this is associated with uh, very, very strong inflammations. So really demonstrating that TLR5 is really important to keep this microbiota in check and avoid the development of chronic uh, inflammation. So this is a case of 10% of the animal that develop very strong inflammation. The other 90% are actually protecting against this kind of uh, severe colitis, but they nonetheless develop some low-grade intestinal inflammation that manifest with a metabolic syndrome. And this is what's uh, represented here. And we know for a long time now there's a link between inflammation and, and obesity and metabolic syndrome. Where you see here on the left part, you have a wild type mice and its counterpart, a leptin knockout, which develop very severe obesity. And here in, in one of our studies, you can see a wild type mice and its counterpart, TLR5 deleted mice. But definitely, even if it's not a strong obesity, uh, you can see that it's nonetheless a pretty well overweight compared to the wild type uh, counterpart. So this is just a, a one example I wanted to bring to give you this concept that it's really, really important to keep the microbiota under control. And if you remove one of the mechanisms involved in keeping this microbiota under control, such as TLR5, this can lead to chronic inflammation leading to colitis or uh, metabolic deregulation. So obviously, there is few humans that are mutated for TLR5, and this is the mutation that, that is happening, and this is associated with uh, some uh, chronic diseases. But definitely, this cannot explain the very, very, very rapid increase in prevalence in uh, inflammatory diseases. So this is just the example of obesity, but you can basically draw similar graph for IBD, uh, type 2 diabetes for every single uh, chronic inflammatory diseases, where you can see that over the last 30, 40 years, there is a very rapid increase in prevalence of those uh, chronic diseases. And this obviously cannot be explained by genetics uh, only. It, it needs to have some environmental uh, component into it. So this is why we, we started to study some food additives uh, eight years ago. And we started by uh, studying dietary emulsifiers, which are highly used by the food industry um, to stabilize mixture of emissible liquids. And they are basically uh, used to improve texture and homogeneity. So just uh, to give you one example, this is here on the left part, uh, a peanut butter that is loaded with emulsifier. And, and you can see this uh, smooth and, and creamy texture. And here on the right part, you have a peanut butter that is emulsifier free. So you do not have any emulsifier in it. And you can see that there is some oil separation. And this is exactly why uh, dietary emulsifiers are loved by the food industry. This is to avoid this, this kind of uh, oil, uh, oil separation. So we decided to focus our first study, our initial study on two of them, which are carboxymethyl cellulose or CMC and polysorbate AT or PAT because they are really highly used, uh, highly used in the States. And we first uh, treated some animals with either CMC or PAT and, and we analyzed microbiota composition. And um, we were able to demonstrate a very strong effect on, on microbiota composition where you see that water treated animals have, have a distinct microbiota compared to PAT treated animals or CMC treated animals. And this is only uh, looking at microbiota composition using 16S sequencing. But uh, we decided also to, to develop some new tools in order to go a little bit further and not to uh, focus only on composition, but also to focus on function. 
And one of the functions that we really like to study in the lab is uh, the microbiota localization. So as I told you during the introduction, we really like to investigate what the distance uh, that separates the microbiota that is here in red from the surface of the epithelium that's uh, labeled here in, in purple. So this is what we did in, in our experimental setup. And you see in water-treated animals, uh, you have a distance that separates the microbiota from the epithelium of approximately 25 to 30 micron. And never ever in any kind of animals, we were able to observe bacteria closer than 10 micrometers. But if we treat the same animals in the same facility, same age, same sex, everything is the same, but we treat them with CMP or TAT, this is actually what we observe. You can uh, appreciate a decrease by around twofold of the distance that separates the microbiota from the surface of the epithelium. And in some cases, and this is the case in one of the bacteria here, uh, this bacterium here, you can see a red dot here. In some cases, there is even some bacterium that are in, in direct contact with the epithelium, where you can imagine what will be the consequences here, where you will have recognition by TLRs, NLRs, and activation of chronic uh, intestinal inflammation. So this is one of the functions of the microbiota we, we like to, to study, and we also like to study uh, what the microbiota pro-inflammatory potential and for this, we use some uh, cells reporters that allow us to quantify the bioactive amount of flagellin and LPS that's expressed by the microbiota. And you can see in water-treated animals, so the blue, uh, the blue uh, histograms here, you can see that it's pretty stable over the time for flagellin on the left and lipopolysaccharide on the right. But if you treat the animals with CMC in orange or PAT in purple, you can see that those uh, microbiota are going to express much more flagellin on the left, as well as lipopolysaccharide uh, on the right, really demonstrating that both CMC and PAT are able to alter microbiota localization, but also uh, what we call microbiota pro-inflammatory potential, meaning the, the, the ability of the microbiota will have to uh, activate pro-inflammatory signaling. So, of course, this is, this is what it's looking like on, on the top of the epithelium, where you now have a lot of bacterium within the mucus layer, and the bacteria that are present are expressing more LPS, they are expressing more flagellin, so you can start to imagine what will be the consequences uh, for the animal. And this is exactly what, what we analyzed next. And we first used uh, IL-10 deficient uh, mice, which are genetically susceptible to develop colitis. And indeed, you can see in water-treated animals they are developing colitis at a rate of uh, approximately 40% uh, uh, after three months of treatment. But if we treat them with CMC or PAT, you can see that now the colitis incidence is uh, uh, more than doubled. And also, very importantly, and this is not represented here, so there is more animal developing colitis, but also the colitis that are observed in those CMC and PAT treated animals are much more severe compared to the uh, water treated uh, animals that develop colitis. So really demonstrating that both CMC and PAT alter, increase the colitis susceptibility and colitis severity in IL-10 deficient uh, animals. So we wanted also, and, and this was actually a, a, an, an idea of uh, Andrew Gevert, my, my mentor during my postdoc. We also wanted to see what would be the consequences in, in wild type host so meaning in animals without any genetical susceptibility. So in terms of inflammation, you can see that the inflammation induced by uh, CMC and PAT after two months of treatment, it's very subtle. I mean, there is an increase, there is a significant increase, but it's, it's very subtle. There is a lot of inter-individual inter variations and it's, it's very, very low level inflammation compared to a collective mice, for example. But when we analyze uh, the metabolic, the, the, what will be the metabolism of those animals, and especially following their body weight, this is what we observed. But you can see that both CMC and PAT treated animals are starting to gain more weight after one month, and, one month and a half to two months of treatment. And you can see that at the end of the experiment, the animals are, uh, are weighting approximately 20% more uh, compared to uh, water treated control animals. So really demonstrating that both CMC and PAT, even in completely normal host without any uh, genetic susceptibility, they can still induce some low-level inflammation that will lead to metabolic deregulation, 
And here I presented only the increase in body weight, but we also have a lot of data on those animals uh, demonstrating that they actually develop some parameter of metabolic uh, syndrome with type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, and so forth and so on. So, so really a lot of detrimental consequences of, of those compounds on, on the health uh, of the intestine. And what we were also uh, able to demonstrate in, in, the, in the subsequent study was that um, they also favor the promotion of the development of uh, colorectal cancer. So when we use uh, the, the AOM-DSS model to induce cancer and we subsequently treated the animals with either CMC or PAD, we were able to demonstrate that both CMC and PAD uh, inflammation are actually nourishing uh, the tumor genesis, and, and you can see that there is more tumor per animal, and the total tumor cell surface is also increased in CMC and PH-treated animals uh, compared to water-treated animals. So, of course, next, we, we also wanted to, uh, to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, what would be the mechanism, because actually our initial uh, uh, hypothesis was that uh, dietary emulsifiers will have a direct impact on the mucus layer, acting like, acting like soap, acting like detergent, uh, but we also wanted to investigate if maybe the microbiota can, cannot also be key in driving the, the pro-inflammatory response. So what we did actually to study the mechanism was uh, to split the system. So uh, again, if we use a conventional mice with a normal microbiota, we treat them with dietary emulsifiers, this is leading to intestinal inflammation. And what we did was to split the system using a mice without any microbiota by using uh, germ-free animals, as well as by using microbiota without any uh, um, uh, host, uh, using in vitro microbiota. And using such approach, what, what we observed was that germ-free animals are actually completely protected from the detrimental impact of emulsifiers. There is no inflammation, there is no metabolic deregulation. They are completely protected, completely healthy, uh, and completely similar to water-treated uh, germ-free mice. But what we found using in vitro microbiota systems, so basically this is systems we are using that we can use to mimic uh, microbiota in vitro, but without any host, we were able to recapitulate what we observed by treating directly the animals, and especially an altered microbiota composition and function with an increased pro-inflammatory state. And what's very elegant also with the use of this in vitro microbiota is we can then transfer uh, uh, in vitro microbiota treated uh, to germ-free uh, recipient mice. And when we did that, this was actually sufficient to drive intestinal inflammation. So really demonstrating that the, the microbiota is a key target of dietary emulsifiers. And just taking microbiota that was previously exposed to dietary emulsifiers is sufficient to drive intestinal inflammation in, uh, in, in, in an animals that will actually never get uh, exposed to any uh, dietary emulsifiers. And what's also very interesting with this model, and, and this is, uh, we are now slightly, slightly drifting to uh, what we are currently doing in the lab, is uh, that uh, again, dietary emulsifiers are directly impacting the microbiota, but not all the microbiota. And uh, what we did in, in the past and was published uh, a couple of years ago, was to use the Alter Schedler flora mice. So um, this is a very elegant mice model where they are not germ-free because uh, they are colonized by eight bacterium, but uh, by being colonized by only eight bacterium, this is a very low complexity microbiota and, and, and a microbiota with a very minimal uh, detrimental consequences. And you can see that in those mice uh, that we called, uh, again, Alter Schedler flora or ASF, you can see that in those ASF animals, they are completely protected from the detrimental impact of emulsifiers. They are not developing inflammation. They are not having any um, uh, altered microbiota pro-inflammatory potential. The microbiota is staying localized at exactly the same localization between emulsifier-treated and, and water-treated animals. So that's really interesting because this is meaning that you actually need, you actually, uh, need to have some specific species to see uh, the detrimental impact of uh, CMC or uh, PAT. So we decided, and, and this is actually what's uh, summarized here, that uh, this is actually bringing the concept that you can have some resistant microbiota that are not harboring any specific uh, species that are going to respond to emulsifiers. So uh, those microbiota are actually going to be completely protected from dietary emulsifiers. 
And this is, for example, the case of ASF animal. And on the other hand, you can have some susceptible microbiota that are going to harbor some specific bacterium that are going to respond to the presence of dietary emulsifiers that are going to acquire a, a more pro-inflammatory state. They are going also to occur the ability to penetrate the mucus layer, which is going to lead to inflammation and metabolic uh, deregulation in the host. And we are actually uh, really working on, on this, um, this concept in, in the laboratory uh, right, right now. And just to give you an, an example of um, why we think this is really, really the case, just wanted to present a, a little bit of uh, unpublished work that we did on uh, using one specific bacterium, which is uh, adherent and invasive Escherichia coli, which is a bacterium that is associated with Crohn's disease. And we decided to use this specific bacterium because it's, it's a bacterium of very high interest because this is a bacterium that can be associated with no disease state at all, but under certain uh, circumstances, it can acquire a pathogenic potential. And we wanted to see if maybe dietary emulsifiers will be able to drive a pathogenicity of this uh, specific bacterium. So what we did here was uh, to take again the ISF mice which again are completely protected. You can see that when we treat those ISF mice with CMC or PAD, they are not developing any inflammation, their spleen weight is not increased, their colon weight and, and fecal lipocalin 2, which are two markers of uh, intestinal inflammation in mice, are not altered at all. And again, those mice are colonized with only eight bacterium. So what we decided to do was uh, to add just one bacterium uh, within this community, which is the, the Escherichia coli I was mentioning before, the, and we use for that as the most famous reference strain, which is the strain LF82. So we now have mice that are harboring nine bacterium, the eight from the ISF uh, flora plus the, the, the LF82 bacterium. And we did exactly the same experiment treated with either water, CMC, or PAD. And what we observed was pretty striking is uh, actually uh, both CMC and, uh, and PAT are now able to drive chronic intestinal inflammation in those animals. You can see this increase in spleen weight, there is an increase in colon weight and increase in, in fecal lipocalin 2 as well. So really, again, demonstrating this concept that just you need to have some specific bacterium to drive the detrimental impacts of dietary emulsifiers. And you can have some resistant microbiota that in the presence of emulsifiers are not going to respond at all. And you can have some susceptible microbiota that are going to uh, um, present some specific bugs, such as uh, adherent invasive E. coli bacteria that are going to respond to the presence of dietary emulsifiers leading to chronic intestinal inflammation, colitis, metabolic deregulation, and so forth and so on. And um, of course, we, we also, so again, everything I presented uh, right so far was only focusing on CMC and PAT. And uh, we got a lot of questions also, and, and especially by the food industry about uh, other emulsifiers. So what we decided uh, to do was again, to use our um, in vitro gut, uh, which is presented here uh, actually. So you can see you have uh, this little chamber here and every single chamber is completely, are completely uh, independent from each other. And we can have up to 48 uh, in an anaerobic chamber, so up to 48 conditions in parallel. And we can treat them with various dietary emulsifiers. And, and uh, this system, it's, it's very important actually, are inoculated with human feces. So we can have some human relevance of, of our research now, right now. And what we did was to use this system to test uh, 20 uh, emulsifiers and, and we selected the 20 that are the, common, the most commonly used by the food industry. And this work was done by, by Sabrine, one, one of my postdocs. And uh, you can see that uh, first, and, and this is actually a good news, we were able to reproduce what we observed before with CMC and PAT. Where in this graph, actually, this is measuring what the global disturbance of the microbiota is. And uh, you can clearly see that compared to control, uh, untreated microbiota, we can see a disturbance of CMC and PAT treated uh, microbiota. And what was very interesting also with this approach is uh, first we were able to um, identify some emulsifiers that are having no impact on, on microbiota uh, composition and microbiota function. You can see this is a case of these uh, three compounds. 
We were able also to identify some MMC files that are having some uh, effects that are similar to PAT and CMC. And we were also able to identify some MMC files that are having much drastic and much more detrimental impact on uh, macrobeta composition and function compared to CMC and PAT. So we really think that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done and, and especially trying to understand why they are not acting in the same way. And we hope to, to be able to provide guidance to the food industry in the coming years and suggesting, for example, to use more specifically those uh, dietary receivers that are not able to activate the pro-inflammatory state of the microbiota and uh, request also to, to stop using those emulsifiers here that are having the, the most detrimental impact on, uh, on the microbiota. But again, there is a lot of food additives that are um, allowed to be used. We can think also that uh, there is very likely some synergistic effects that can occur between multiple emulsifiers. So there is still a lot of work that, that needs to be done. And this is why we are currently expanding our in vitro microbiota uh, system because this is going to be a, of a very high use for us in, in the coming years. And I also was, wanted uh, to, to mention a little bit about the human relevance, because again, of course, everything I presented so far was uh, using mice or, or in vitro uh, gut, but even if it's using human feces, this, this is not telling you uh, much about human relevance. So what we did after publishing our, our initial study on, on dietary receivers was to launch a study with uh, again, Andrew, Andrew Gevert, which was my, my mentor during my postdoc, and Gary Wu, and Jim Lewis from the University of Pennsylvania. And what we did was uh, to launch the fresh, what we call the fresh study for functional research on emulsifiers in human. Uh, and uh, this was an inpatient study where we basically took uh, 16 participants that we locked in an hospital room for two weeks. Uh, and you can see that during three days, they were treated with an emulsifier free diet. So we were providing food to them that we knew are completely emulsifier free. And after three days of what we can call a washout period, uh, they were treated for 12 days with either the same emulsifier free diet, so they stay on emulsifier completely free diet, or they were switched to a CMC supplemented diet to see the impact of CMC on uh, macrobiota as well as metabolism. And we collected a lot of samples from, from those uh, patients. Uh, we collected blood, we collected feces, uh, we performed GTT, ITT. We also collected colonic biopsies, uh, as you can see here, because again, we really think that uh, macrobiota localization is key, is really key in driving the detrimental impact of, uh, of emulsifiers. So we were able to, uh, to collect colonic biopsy, both at the end of the washout period as well as at the end of the, the CMC supplementation phases. So we will see what, what will be the impact of CMC on, on macrobiota localization. And we are currently, we are still working on analyzing the data. We are still working on unblinding everything. Uh, so I cannot share much uh, with you today. So and I guess I will have to, to speak again during one of your, one of your webinars in, in the coming month. And, um, but we still have some, um, we nonetheless have some, some uh, very nice uh, data showing that indeed uh, macrobiota localization is, is really important in humans. And I just wanted to briefly uh, mention this study that we did in the past with uh, Shanti Srinivasan from Emory University, where uh, what we did was to analyze macrobiota localization in uh, patients with uh, or without metabolic syndrome. And you can see here on this patient uh, on the top left part, uh, this is a normal patient with a normal BMI, uh, a normal HbA1c, and without any uh, diagnosed diabetes mellitus. And you can see that the macrobiota is actually uh, kept at a safe distance, and you are able to observe this no man's land here that separates the macrobiota from the surface of the epithelium. And here in this other patient, which is actually having a pretty high BMI of 38.2, uh, as well as a pretty high HbA1c of 8.2, and, and it's actually a patient that is diagnosed with uh, diabetes, you can see that you are able to observe some bacteria that are encroaching upon its host and that are penetrating the normally sterile mucus layer and, and getting really in close contact uh, with the epithelium. So of course, this is only two representative images, but when we put all the more than 30 patients we were able to include in this study, you can clearly see that there is indeed a very strong correlation that occurs 
between the severity of uh, metabolic dysfunction, which is uh, characterized here by the increase in HbA1c, and the, and the severity of microbiota encroachment. And you can see that the patients with the more severe metabolic dysfunction are actually harboring a microbiota that is the more severely encroached, while the patients uh, with the less severe metabolic dysfunction is having a microbiota that is kept at a safe distance from the host. So this is very interesting uh, for us, and, and we are still uh, working on to see if this is actually just a correlation or if there is also some causation. And we are actually uh, trying right now to identify those mucus invaders. And, and for this, I'm, we just developed the techniques that I'm, I'm going to present you right now. And what we want to do is actually to collect specifically those invaders to see if they are able to drive metabolic deregulation and to drive chronic inflammation uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a, when transplanted to a new host. And for this, what, what we recently developed uh, is um, based on laser capture macro dissection, where we can use this technique to selectively uh, select, you can see here, the inner mucus layer, and we can then use the laser macro dissector to specifically collect this mucus layer. And we can uh, then extract the DNA, and we're actually lucky to have enough DNA to identify which bacterium are associated with uh, this kind of very, very tiny piece of mucus layer. And when we did that in, in the laboratory, you can uh, see that they are actually harboring a very distinct microbial population compared to fecal material, as well as compared to a crude uh, mucosa extract. Uh, and we are currently working on, on uh, characterizing those bacteria and identifying actually who is present in, in, in this specific niche. And we are also, of course, comparing uh, water-treated versus emulsifier-treated animals, as well as human as part of our fresh uh, clinical investigations. And just to finish during the last uh, five minutes, I, I just wanted to give a little bit more of an optimistic note and, and a little bit of hope where well, basically what I presented so far during this presentation was how to make animal and human sick. And I wanted to finish by uh, presenting uh, some of the work we are doing to try to prevent and inhibit uh, intestinal inflammation. And for this, and again, we really think that microbiota encroachment and, and the ability of some bacteria, that we call the invaders to penetrate the mucus is really key in driving inflammation and, and metabolic deregulation. So we wanted to develop a system and an approach to try to inhibit those mucus invaders. And what we did was uh, we decided to try to train the immune system in order to avoid the presence of invaders. And just uh, to explain this, the concept behind that is we knew that there is some specific bacteria that can indeed penetrate the mucus layer. And we know that flagella, uh, which is mainly composed of flagellin, and, you know, which is um, giving motility to, to the bacterium, and we know that flagella is actually very important to promote microbiota encroachment. And we know that flagella is used by the bacteria to penetrate the mucus layer. And what we also know from a study we did with Ruth Lay and Tyler Cullander in, in back in uh, 2013, we know that if you have some specific antibodies that are um, directed against flagella, the bacteria are actually going to shut down flagella expression. And, and this is a very, very strong effect that uh, we don't really know yet the mechanism, but this is basically a protective mechanism by the bacterium, where if uh, there is antibodies that are starting to recognize its flagella, it's going to shut down uh, flagella expression to escape the immune system. And we wanted to see if we cannot use this uh, observation in order to train the immune system, in order to avoid to have flagella expression, in order to relocate and um, uh, inhibit microbiota encroachment. So this is what uh, we did by immunizing uh, animals with purified flagellin. And you can see that uh, when we did this, uh, this um, uh, immunization to mice, we are indeed able to uh, uh, provide a very high amount of fecal antiflagellin IgA. So again, this is, uh, um, those antibodies are, are, are going to be expressed by the mucosa within the fecal matter. So this is uh, where we want to, to uh, to have the, the, them to be expressed in order to avoid microbiota encroachment. And you can indeed see that immunized animals are expressing very high amount of uh, fecal antiflagellin in the globally compared to the non-immunized uh, animals. 
And what's very good also with this approach is that uh, this is a very long lasting effect that even after the last injection as part of our immunization protocol, uh, the animals are kept uh, immunized compared to the non uh, immunized animals. So of course, next we analyzed if indeed our hypothesis will hold true even within the microbiota, and especially if such immunization will be sufficient to drive a decrease in expression of flagella by the uh, microbiota. And this is indeed the case where you can clearly see that in wild type animals, uh, if you compare non-immunized animals and immunized animals, you can clearly see this uh, pretty dramatic decrease in flagella expression uh, in the microbiota of immunized animals compared to the non-immunized animals. And next, of course, we next analyzed, because this was our central hypothesis, we next analyzed microbiota localization. And you can see that in wild type mice, again, if you immunize them, by shutting down flagella expression, you are going to actually to relocate the microbiota at a further and increased distance from the mucosa. You can see this is uh, this increase here uh, between immunized animals and non-immunized animals. And it seems that this effect is really uh, antibody driven because when we used uh, mu anti animals that are unable to synthesize any uh, uh, specific antibodies, you can see that we are losing the protection. So it, it seems that this is really driven by the adaptive immune system, and more specifically by the uh, antifragilin uh, immunoglobulin A. And next, of course, we analyzed uh, what will be the consequences in terms of uh, susceptibility to, to inflammation. So for this, we use the uh, anti ILTAN receptor antibody model of colitis. And you can see that this is a very strong uh, colitis model where uh, when we used uh, wild type animals and we induced colitis, you can see this, this very dramatic increase in colitis, uh, colitis score in those animals. And when we did exactly the same experiment, but on immunized animals, uh, you can see this uh, pretty uh, dramatic protection against colitis. So it's not a perfect protection. The animals are not going back to zero but it's, it's still uh, decreased by around three-fold of the histological score, which is a very, very good protection in such a model of the immunized animals compared to the non-immunized uh, animal. And here again, this, it seems that this is really driven by antifragilin IgA, uh, because when we did the same experiments in animals that are not able to uh, synthesize any uh, immunoglobulin, you see that we are completely losing the protection, and uh, both animals develop actually very severe colitis, so meaning that it seems we really need to have the antifragilin IgA to drive uh, the protection in this, uh, in this uh, model. And um, just to, to finish it, uh, this is again some, uh, some data that are part of our uh, most recent publication. And, and there is, this is actually, I think, uh, opening a lot of questions. And what we did here was to analyze and compare the antifragilin uh, immunoglobulin A load and fragilin load in a human feces. And you can see that it seems that there is indeed a, an inverse correlation where in uh, people with a very high level of anti-fragilin uh, immunoglobulin A, you have pretty low level of fecal fragilin. While in patients with low level of anti-fragilin A, it seems you have an increase in fragilin uh, level. So this is opening a lot of questions. And what's also very interesting here is you see that we are able to have uh, three groups of patients. We are able to have some uh, normal patients, some overweight patients, and some obese individuals. And you can see that all the obese individuals are clustering on the left part of the graph, which is characterized by a low level of antifragilin immunoglobulin A and a high level of uh, fragilin, fecal fragilin. So we are, this is very interesting to us because this is suggesting that maybe if uh, in those patients we are able to boost and immunize them by boosting the antifragilin immunoglobulin A response, maybe this is going to decrease fragilin lo load in their fecal uh, material, uh, providing a protection against microbiota encroachment and providing a, a protection against metabolic deregulation and, and the severe form of, uh, of obesity. So this is a, a lot of work going on in the laboratory uh, right now uh, around this, uh, this concept here. And uh, of course, I just wanted to finish by uh, thanking all parts and all the members that are involved in, in this research. This is definitely a, a collaborative uh, work. And uh, I have uh, two postdocs in the lab right now, Sabrine and Noemi, that are doing a lot of these experiments, uh, Charlene and Hong as well in the laboratory. And you can see that this is definitely a collaborative work, uh, a lot of collaborators uh, in um, various places. And of course, our, our funders, 
the ERC, the Cronin Collectives Foundation, as well as the Kenneth Reading Foundation uh, have been really keen in supporting all of this work. And uh, thank you for, for your attention. I will be really, really happy to, to answer any question you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benoit. Uh, thank you, Christian. Great, uh, great talk. And uh, so, as always, you, you have the possibility to, to write down some uh, questions or you can unmute and ask them directly if you prefer. Jerry, do you follow up on the conversation? Because I'm not very good at this. Uh, yes. Um, yes, if, uh, you can uh, type your question in the chat. Or you can also, because we are not so many of us, you can yeah. also unmute if you prefer. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask a question. This is Barbara Hansen. Um, I'm fascinated with uh, the whole idea of the mucus layer being, um, you know, an important feature here. And I have a student who's uh, actually doing research on Crohn's disease, but you never mentioned Crohn's. Is there any possibility that any of these experiments uh, could be a signal? as to what might be going on in Crohn's or at least what might work to reduce it? Yeah, so I mean, we really think that the, the same kind of concept is happening in Crohn. And for example, if, if you take some mucus deficient animals are going to develop very severe colitis that are mimicking Crohn's. Uh, so we really think that the, the host mucus interaction, I mean, the mucus microbiota interaction is also very important in Crohn's. Uh, we are actually uh, launching some, some studies in, in Crohn's patient, trying to investigate what, um, what is the identity of the invaders in, in these populations. And uh, we are also launching right now a, a clinical study with uh, Kevin Whelan from the King's College London to see if, uh, and this is really focusing on the Crohn's population, to see if uh, by avoiding dietary emulsifiers, we can restore a normal host microbiota interaction and, and, and protect against the disease. So yeah, for sure, I mean, I, I presented a lot of um, low-grade inflammation and metabolic deregulation, but we definitely think that the same kind of uh, alteration are, are uh, happening in, in Crohn's disease and, and maybe also in, in ulcerative colitis. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Maybe meanwhile, I, I'm very interested by the, uh, say, uh, uh, bioreactor, I mean, that you have described, if I may tell so, regarding the uh, analysis of the microbiome. And obviously, one can really see the potential. Uh, I have a question because, I mean, and you have this, uh, you have really described this, but in a real life intestine, uh, the different population of microbiota will be facing different concentration of oxygens. Yes. And that will obviously have a major impact on the relative proportion of uh, strictly anaerobics, uh, anaerobics and so on. So obviously a model cannot mimic everything, but I understand that in this model, I mean, everybody has the same concentration of oxygen, obviously. Yes, which is zero. I mean, this is everything, all the system, I don't, I don't know if you can see here on, on this picture on the top left. Yes. Everything is within an anaerobic chamber, so there is no oxygen. Oh, okay, okay. This is what, sorry, what, what I missed. Okay, so everything is with zero oxygen. Yeah, everything is with zero oxygen. And for us, I mean, we are really interested in the colonic microbiota. And, and again, this is where uh, the host, I mean, to us, especially at the mucus uh, side, because most of the immune system and, and the host microbiota interaction would be really important uh, based on what we are seeing in the lab. Uh, in the colon. So mimicking the colonic microbiota for us is definitely the most important. And we are definitely viewing this system also as a screening uh, thing where we can screen molecules, uh, we can screen uh, various doses, we can screen combination of molecules. But then, of course, we want to go back to the animals to see what will be the, 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 what will be the effect in, the, in a real in vivo, uh, in vivo setup. Yeah. I but did that's not a very yeah. good system because we can have up to 48 conditions in parallel. So, uh, and again, for example, for CMC and PAT, they are not really acting through the same mechanism. Uh, PAT is really altering gene expression. Uh, uh, no, PAT is really altering, um, sorry, microbiota composition. So it's basically killing some bugs 
and favoring some other bugs. While CMC, it's, it's not really altering microbiota composition, but it's really altering uh, microbiota gene expression. So it's going to increase and, and decrease gene expression by some specific bugs. So what we think is going to happen if we combine them is we are very likely going to have a synergistic effect. And this is something we are currently investigating using this uh, in vitro gut system. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bruchel, we have a question um, from Baban So So. I apologize yeah. for mispronouncing this. So Vajra uh, in the yeah. chat, um, I'll go ahead and unmute so you can ask. Yeah, Baban. Hi, uh, can you hear me? I'm on, um, I'm on yeah. the phone. Yes. So um, I was just curious about where did you select what rust to control? Because, you know, the CMC inherently has a lot of mucoadhesive properties and also metabolized by some of the microbes. Um, you know, P80 might be different, but, you know, that might have some effect on some of these uh, things that you're seeing. I'm just curious. And also, did you happen to do some studies on lecithin, like natural emulsifiers? Because emulsifiers is a very broad category, which comes into, you know, from natural to, you know, functional food to other. Uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. That, that's definitely a uh, complex, uh, complex question. You're on your right. And most of those emulsifiers, they don't really have the same emulsifying properties. There is one that are very, very good in emulsifying things. There is one that are not doing a, such a good job. Uh, they are also acting like thickener. And this is a case of CMC. It's acting, it's acting like a thickener. But why we decided to use CMC and PIT at the first place was well, uh, first they are both highly used by the food industry and also they are not metabolized at all by the host. And this is uh, some very old study back, uh, you know, when uh, this was using some radio, radioactive uh, form of, of those emulsifier where they were able to demonstrate that they are actually not metabolized in neither CMC nor PIT. And this is actually what we are seeing in our fresh study in human, where we use, when we use CMC, uh, we are able to find uh, almost all of it in the feces. So this is definitively not metabolized by the microbiota. Uh, so this is why we decided to use those two. Uh, and in, regarding your question about soil acetin, so yeah, for sure, yeah, this was definitely one of, one of them that was included in, in this uh, screening that we did, that we recently did. We are still working on analyzing the data. But it seems that uh, soil acetin is definitely one of the good one of the good guy. So we can think about yeah, favoring the use of this kind of uh, soil acetin with um, low impact on the microbiota and, and avoiding uh, using the one with uh, very strong impact on the microbiota. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Do we have other questions? Uh, I have a question regarding the, I mean, the, the flagellin and anti-flagellin. This is really very, very stimulating. So I have a question regarding the, the specificity you can expect, I mean, from this. Uh, I mean, in other words, do you see this as a, something that you can extend, expand to different systems? Uh, I mean, what is, you see, what, what is at, in the end the, the overall relevance. I do understand the point with this antigenic antibody system, but how do you see a kind of a generalization, if I may say? So, um, first, yeah, there is still a, a lot that needs to be done on, on this. Yeah. And here, for example, this was by injecting purified flagellin to the mice, and this is obviously never going to be used yeah. in humans. So, we are currently working with a company. Uh, to deliver purified flagellin directly within the mucosa because this is actually where we want to target the immunization. Yeah. So we will have some purified flagellin directly delivered to the mucosa uh, in order to, to avoid and, and, and prevent microbiota encroachment. Uh, just to mention also, and this is also relevant to the Crohn's, uh, Crohn's disease patient as we just uh, discussed in, in one of the previous questions. Actually in Crohn's disease patients, there is an increase in uh, anti-flagellin uh, antibody in the feces. And what we think is happening is this is actually what we think. Uh, this is actually a, a protective mechanism, a mechanism of defense. But in Crohn's disease, there is just too many hints and there is also genetic susceptibility and too many hits. And it's not sufficient to avoid chronic inflammation. But what we think is if we come earlier, if we come earlier or if we, or if we come stronger, we can actually use this kind of immunization against flagellin to protect against uh, chronic inflammation. And, and there is a lot of work going on in the lab right now about that. 
And what we want also to do is, uh, since we are currently uh, identifying invaders using our special um, laser micro dissection methods, we want after to identify what are the mechanisms by which those invaders are penetrating the mucosa and try to use some similar inhibitory approach to avoid microbiota encroachment by those invaders. So this is definitely opening much more questions when, when this is giving answers and, and we are definitely working on, on that aspect. But you are totally right, but right now all this is going to be used in a human setting. We, we, we actually have no idea for now. No, but that's very, very stimulating. Thank you very much. So do we have some final questions? Jay? Um, I don't see any in the chat. Uh, did anybody else have any questions? No, I don't. Well, I have one more question. This is Barbara Please. Hansen again. Yeah. Um, I was fascinated with your slide that was relating to metabolic syndrome and the glucose and hemoglobin A1C. It looked to me as a specialist in that area, like really only the diabetics. Yeah, back one right there. All of the all of the diabetics, those are the ones with 6.4 or so and higher hemoglobin A1C, were in one group. Yes. And if if you look at the other part, I've got you here. There it is. They seem not spread out, meaning it's the missing obese and the missing normals, and that glucose itself or hemoglobin A1C or the diabetic diagnosis seems to be. Yeah. Uh, the biggest factor there. Yes, you're entirely right. And, and this is actually the only significance we are, because of course we also have BMI for those patients. We have a lot of clinical data for those patients. And the only thing that was uh, able to correlate very strongly with microbiota encroachment was uh, diabetes, type two diabetes status. So you're entirely right. What we did, because we were also thinking that maybe uh, this is actually a consequence, and we are thinking that maybe in those uh, diabetic patients, you have some uh, glucose leakage through the gut, and you will have some glucose that are going to be present in the mucus that are going to, of course, attract the bacterium. So we did some experiment where you, we induced very strong type 1 diabetes uh, to try to mimic this kind of uh, leakage uh, phenomenon, but this was not associated with encroachment. So we don't think this is a, a consequence of diabetes. But you are entirely right that uh, there is here again a lot of questions that are um, that are going to, that are opening but that, that are open by this study. First, we don't know yet for sure if this is consequence or cause of the disease. We don't know neither what are the you know, identity of the, of those bacteria. Uh, so this is why we, we want to um, to identify them using the laser macro dissection. Uh, but yeah, for sure, what we think in, in this particular study, what we found. Well, that this is really driving and associating, sorry, with uh, type 2 diabetes, you're entirely right, not BMI. Yeah, I would urge you to stick with the type 2 model. A type 1 is such a different disease, and yes, you, are, we, you are yourself manipulating the glucose, where in this it's the disease process. So yes. I, would, I would urge you to stick with the type 2. Yes, yes, yes. when we use the type 1 was just to induce and, I mean, try to mimic and this is what we did actually, what we did in this model, we induced a very strong, and we use a very strong model of type one diabetes. We were able to observe that there is indeed more glucose that are leaking, but this was, this was not associated with microbiota encroachment. So this was just, I mean, we just wanted to use this as, as trying to investigate that indeed, this is not, microbiota encroachment is not a consequence, but it's very likely much more a cause of, uh, of uh, type 2 diabetes in, in this model. But you're right that we, we definitely want to focus with type 2 diabetes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So first, I see the conversation. So uh, we have congratulations to our speaker, Benoit. So that's great. Uh, and then uh, we have a question with, uh, if I understand correctly, is, uh, are there emulsifiers used by the food industry that do not disrupt the microbiota? Uh, so there is, there is some, and this is why we used um, um, our in vitro gut. Uh, so again, this is only using the in vitro gut, so we still have to find the in vivo relevance of this. But yeah, definitely you can see that there is, and this is the case of the three emulsifiers here uh, that are used. Uh, some of them are used by the food industry, not all of them. You can see that they are not having any detrimental impact on the, on the microbiota, so we want to, to confirm that in vivo. But if this is the case, yeah, this will mean that indeed there is some emulsifiers that are not acting 
detrimental uh, on the micro beta, which is definitely a, a very good news. Yeah. Uh, okay. Christian, I have I have a question if you don't mind. If you have like please, one minute. please, please. So uh, the the there is a lot of uh, you know, in the immune system maturation, especially uh, driven by the command cells, especially like molecules like you know polysaccharide A. Uh, don't you think that some of these uh, mucus encroachment by command cell may be a good thing for the immune uh, maturation or immune development uh, in that respect? I mean. So yeah, we we are we are doing some work in, in trying to uh, better characterize what the immune response to emulsifiers, and we are characterizing what the immune cells population in the intestine, and more specifically in the colon of these uh, emulsifier treated animals. But what we really think here, this may play a, a role, and this maybe uh, is having a beneficial impact on the immune cells population in the gut. But what we really think is very important is the inflammation. And for sure, those compounds by promoting encroachment are promoting inflammation, which is very, very detrimental in every single model we use in the lab. So even if this is having beneficial impact on the immune cell population, this is not able to uh, counteract and counterpart the, the, the chronic inflammation. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much again. Thank you to everybody for attending this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, Jerry will post a further series of seminars, including some of them on the interplay between uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and microbiome, you will see, which will be of interest. And, uh, and we keep all of us in touch. And uh, as always, be safe, all of you. And uh, thank you very much, Benoit. Good, uh, good evening in Paris. You're very welcome. Thank you. See you bye soon. Bye. 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 See you soon.